one of the difficulties of picking up with what you had intended to say is a wonderful question and response that gets you off in all kinds of directions. And it's very difficult. I thought the questions were so good. Uh, I would like to try to respond to one that came from over in this quarter a little bit more that had to do with uh, the disagreements among Christians and how that relates to this issue of having Christian knowledge. And uh, it's very important to understand how uh, the issue of knowledge relates to those disagreements. And a large part of what you have to say is that Christians, in their disagreements, must exercise humility. And that will mean that they are very careful about what they claim to know. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the reasons why, in the history of American universities, theology was dropped was people began to realize that so much that was being taught as theology was just tradition. And so you had your various traditions, but they, it could not be defended as knowledge. And therefore, they threw the whole thing out. See, I think one of the differences in the European situation is that theology is still included in the universities. In America, they, as we say, hived off the theological schools. Occasionally you will have one, like at Princeton, where it is on the grounds, but it's not integrated as a part of the curriculum. Now, that's a tragedy, you see. And in many cases, your theological schools are totally separate. In most cases, they're totally separate from any university. And uh, we need to talk about knowledge in our churches and in our fellowships, and we need to distinguish the things that constitute, shall we say, something like the solid ecumenical uh, creedal position of the church. And not all of that will go in either, but most of it will, in my opinion, defensively and clearly fall into the area of knowledge when it is clarified. And then we need to, with humility, recognize that a lot of things that are near and dear to us are not knowledge. They can still be near and they can still be dear and in many cases, they were very much a part of our upbringing. That's a part of what Paul calls the vessel, as distinct from the treasure. So it's really important to deal with that issue, because people looking on from the outside, they can't tell the difference. And they need to have intelligent, humble awareness within the fellowships of the Christians as to what the difference is. One other question. This came up uh, as a text and we wanted to respond to it. Western society has elevated knowledge at the expense of intuition. What place does Dallas give to intuition? Without intuition there is no knowledge. It's just that simple. Knowledge and intuition are not inherently opposed to one another. They become opposed when people begin to take intuition as a method. Intuition is an outcome of method. If you apply method, at some point you will be blessed with intuitions. Well, uh, for example, uh, a person who is carefully trained in any field, let us take one that's not thought of normally, I suppose, as a major field, but interior decorating. 
Now, people who are in that field, some people are very good at it and others aren't. <laughs> the ones who are good at it are able to have intuitive judgments as to what is appropriate and what is not. This is characteristic of artistic judgment and ethical judgment and most fields where we're engaged in some practice. It's the intuitions of the practiced mind and spirit that are indispensable. You have to have them. And that is very high in spiritual development also. But you have to have method in the spiritual life. You cannot dispense with it. Uh, we are to talk about that in the next and final hour today. Is more about method. Um, but intuition also has some drawbacks because it's, it's like God told me also has the drawbacks. You know, well, does God ever tell anyone anything? Yes, he does. But don't pull it on people, you know. And you don't want to pull your intuitions on people. Hopefully they would be asking for them because they know you. And they know that when you're talking about how colors and shapes go together in a room to produce an effect, you really do know what you're talking about. And therefore they want to know what your intuitions are. So we, we earn that. And uh, also uh, intuitions are communal. Like all knowledge, when they form knowledge, they are communal. That is to say, they live in community. And they are shared. That's another thing that is wrong with God told me, uh, or my intuition, is they become little private power bases. And that is not in the nature of the community the human community, and certainly not in the nature of Christ's community. And uh, so it's really important to talk about intuition and its role, uh, because without it there is no knowledge in any field without intuition. You cannot start with method. You learn your method beginning with intuition. That's any method. And uh, if you don't have uh, the intuitions to provide a home for your method and something for them to work on and something for them to relate to more generally, uh, then your method will get you nowhere. And you, you can find many, many illustrations of this in life, not least in Issues like administration, where you're dealing with people, you're trying to lead, you have to have not just method. One of the problems, at least in my part of the world, for much recent thinking about the church is the idea that there is a method. And if you just work that method, you will get the outcome you desire. Well, that's a long story. <laughs> so, let me just begin this afternoon's session, and this would be on page two of your handout, uh, by saying that the heart, the question at the heart of professed Christianity is how we think about Jesus and his relation to knowledge and reality. So that's what I want to talk about this, in this hour, um, but uh, let's just say that we have a real problem there. Along with the relocation of Christian teaching and faith outside the domain of knowledge goes the relocation of Jesus outside that domain. If you ask a Christian audience who is the smartest person in the world, it will take them a while to work around to Jesus. Because when you raise the question in that way, they automatically go to some Einstein or someone of that sort. 
Now, if you have any children in the group that have been in Sunday school, they'll come up with Jesus pretty fast. <laughs> now, this is really true. You can do this empirically, and it's actually a very good way of developing some good conversation. But you'll find that children take seriously this idea that Jesus is the greatest. And so if he's the greatest, he obviously must be the smartest. He couldn't be the greatest unless he were the smartest. But it takes a while to, uh, for the adult mind that has been conditioned to put two and two together and figure out that if he was divine, he wouldn't be dumb. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it, you know, when you uh, put the two and two together. But that takes a little doing, and we have to be sympathetic and careful with how we do it. But each one of us, just like uh, the worship songs that we had, and uh, the words about how we think about them, you see, we, for each of us, the question really is, how do we think about Jesus? How do we think about him? And he, of course, uh, put those questions in his own time because he was faced with the problem of readjusting the concept of the Messiah in the culture that was his own. And so he asked those questions. What think you of Christ? <coughs> Whose son was he? And he knew that everyone would say David's. And so then he put the stinger in at that point. Because uh, no father, Jewish father, is going to call his son Lord. And so how could David call the Messiah Lord? That became a set piece in the message of the early church. It was readjusting the concept of the Messiah. And he asked his own disciples, you remember, who do you say that I am? So now that's really uh, bottom line. Who do I say that he is? And, of course, there are a lot of things to be said about that. But if you have a picture of him as simply a sacrificial lamb, if that's all you have, you haven't got him. And you will come up with a pathetic version of what the crucifixion was. Whereas it was not a pathetic occasion. Go back and read the story and realize that Jesus was entirely in charge of the events. Pilate was not in charge. The high priest was not in charge. He was playing them like an accordion. They, of course, foolishly thought they were in charge. But he helped Pilate, for example, understand that. When Pilate said, don't you know I have power to take your life? And he said, Jesus said to him, you wouldn't have any power if it had not been given to you <coughs> from above. Right? And actually the language there in John 19 is exactly the same as in John 3 where Jesus is talking about being born from above. The power of government comes from the same place that the new birth comes from. And Jesus was in charge of the whole thing. He was not a victim. So if he wasn't a victim, well, then you have to rethink. And uh, the New Testament actually engages in a pattern of rethinking about Jesus that begins with, is not this the carpenter or the carpenter's son? and ends up with the king of kings in Revelation 1. The king of kings. That, by the way, is not later. Who's your man that just got elected to run your life?
He, he may not know it, but he just got a job with Jesus. That's his boss. And it would be wonderful if he could come to terms with that. <laughs> and things will go much better for your country if he does. But that's the teaching about who Jesus is. Now, he couldn't show up around Nazareth that way. And he had to keep it under cover. A few times the cover was blown, like on the Mount of Transfiguration. But he couldn't go around like that. It would frighten the horses. <laughs> no one could deal with it. And that, of course, is the issue, is how can you come to terms with God? And God solves that problem by coming to terms with us. He, though well, he was in the form of God, did not think it was, there was anything wrong with being like that. He just handed it over and be, humbled himself and came in the form of people and humbled himself so far as to become uh, the death on the cross. Therefore has God exalted him. Why? Because he could be totally trusted with total power. That's why God has exalted him and has given him a name that is above every name. It isn't like God must crush the life out of the cosmos to win. He wins in the form of his son. And that's what's going on even now. So the question uh, at the heart of our whole discussion has to do with how we think about Jesus. And I want you to try the language which I have here in the first paragraph of the second page of your handout. These writers in the scripture, what were they doing? They were providing essential knowledge of the human condition in this universe. And you have to, in order to understand that, you have to put that down beside everyone else who is trying to do that. So, in general, these are people who hang around our think tanks or our universities, and they are trying to make sense of the human condition in this universe. And so they have a lot of things to say to you about who you are, about uh, what's good for you, about uh, possibilities for you, uh, and of course the leading indicators from that direction is you are your brain, or perhaps more generally your DNA. And now where are you going to go with that? Not very far, but that's a vision that comes from those who are trying to do what the writers of the scripture do, which is to give you an understanding of who you are, what world you're in, what's good for you, what you might be, what's your best course of action. See. And the culmination of that message is your best course of action is to become an apprentice of Jesus Christ, learning how to live in the kingdom of God. But you see, you have to pull like crazy to keep that from falling into religious gobbledygook and out of real life. So you have to think hard about what you read in the scripture to keep it dealing with life and not something religious. Now, of course, it deals with religion, too. And uh, religion needs a lot of help from it. And, of course, religion becomes a problem. It was a big problem for Jesus. It was a big problem for the prophets. It was a big problem for Paul. It continues to be a big problem because humans try to take control of it. And the idea that Jesus is the one who builds his church. And so you want to be sure that you are working with him on his plan. 
and that can keep religion from becoming deadly. But it's the only thing that can. Now, you can't get rid of religion because that's the human form of response to God. And, of course, a lot of people think that's the only issue uh, to deal with is how to deal with religion. And so a lot of the popular writers now focus on religion, and their main objection to God is religion. See? And uh, that's very unfortunate. One can understand it. But what we need to keep in mind is the reality of Christ's church and his people is not a human organization. It can intersect with that, and it should. And the only hope of the human organization is that it should intersect with the kingdom of God. And we have to talk more about what that amounts to because the talk about the kingdom of God itself uh, becomes problematic. And, for example, in long periods of history, people have tried to identify the kingdom of God with the church. And the kingdom of God is in real trouble if that's true. <laughs> but, of course, it isn't true. And, and the people of Christ continue to break out and to challenge and to refresh and renew uh, the church as the visible organization of human huma humanity uh, in terms of what is thought to have been said by Jesus. So, now, uh, we, all of that to just try to put Jesus in the right perspective. He brings to us the kingdom of God, and what he says is, the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, what that means that it is right where you are. <coughs> right where you are. And um, you can begin to interact with it immediately. Um, Jesus was plowing around the organizations that had conspired in the name of God to shut people out of the kingdom of God. And it had a long list of who was in and who was out. And so when Jesus comes, one of the first things he does after he enters his ministry is to begin to undermine that list. And so right after announcing that the kingdom of God is available to you where you are, he begins to give you a list of who is blessed. And that list is exactly an inversion of the human list. So if you read the Beatitudes in Matthew, for goodness sakes, please don't think they are telling you to do something. Like, for example, mourn. They're not telling you to mourn. They're telling you that if you are in mourning, that in the kingdom of God is a place of blessedness. Not because of mourning. There's nothing particularly good about mourning. And when you're caught up in it, you know that. Not just pretending. I mean, you're really mourning. Then you know you've got something that grips you and crushes you. And Jesus is simply saying, you too are blessed in the kingdom of God. The Beatitudes are proclamation of the gospel. They are not things for you to do. In Luke, you get the woe bees as well as the blesseds. Woe be to you that are rich. So all rich people go to hell. High-priced intellects teach that. That if you are rich, you are bound for hell. And they haven't known many poor people and discovered there's no particular virtue in being poor. That poor people can be just as mean as rich people and maybe even meaner and less likely to trust God. So you, 
It, you see, Jesus is proclaiming the presence of the kingdom to the people that are ordinarily thought to be out of its reach. And, of course, with the Wobies in Luke 6, he's saying the people normally thought to be in are not necessarily. Right? So he says, woe be to you that laugh now. Well, I can tell a lot of you people are in trouble. <laughs> I've heard, already heard enough to see that. You know, of course, he wasn't teaching that there was anything wrong with laughing. But that has left a morbid imprint on very much of historic Christianity. The idea that if you are miserable, everything else being equal, you're closer to God. <laughs> right? Or the other teaching, if you're poor, everything else being equal, you're closer to God. Uh, and, and of course, one of the strategies of Satan to defeat Jesus is to make him look like an idiot. And the way that normally works is you take his saying and form a legalism out of it and associate righteousness with that. And then, of course, all is lost. Because what he's after is the transformation of the whole person through living in the kingdom of God. So now here's his main teaching about how to know the truth. It's in John 8. This is on your sheet. It's in John 8, 31, 32. And we need to pay careful attention to it. Uh, Jesus is talking to people who had believed on him. They had believed on him. Now he's telling them how they can know. Now watch the language in 31 and 32, and you'll see that. People who have believed still need to know. Believing has a rootless quality to it without knowledge. And it will not carry you through. And so now, a very famous statement written on the wall of more universities than any other statement. In German, French, Latin, Italian, English, the truth will make you free. Now, how many of you know that Jesus never said that? He never said it. He said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. That's what he said. Now we all know you shouldn't take someone's sentence, extract a part of it, and say that's what they said. This is a description of how people come to have the knowledge that will bring them to the place to where they will never think they have to do things that are wrong again. The freedom promised here is freedom from the bondage of sin. You read the passage, you'll see that. Freedom from the bondage of sin. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And you would never again be in a position of saying that you, well, you know it's wrong, but I have to do it. Do you ever hear, do they say in this country, business is business? Do they say that? You know what someone's getting ready to do when they say that? <laughs> They're getting ready to do something they know is wrong. <coughs> they never say it unless they understand. That's it. See, imagine living as a business person in a world where you never had to say that. And... Uh, Nearly everyone wants to be free from wrongdoing. There are very few people that would say, you know, I would really miss lying if I stopped it. Um, or any other thing that we know to be wrong. But we keep doing it. Why do we do it? Everyone wants to be good, but they find it's necessary to do evil. 
Now, that's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about coming into a position of personal growth and habituation in the kingdom of God where you never think you have to do something is wrong in order to survive. Now, I like to be there. That's a good place to be. And that is what he is talking about. So I've given a little different wording here, underlined and bolded on the bottom of page two of your handout, to try to put this in a more street-level piece of language. Because, see, there's a big challenge. We are trained to think, if I don't do this, what's going to happen to me? And that's the challenge to take things into your own hands. And that is the form of all wrongdoing. That is the form in which our sister Eve experienced temptation. She was shown something very good. And she was told, if you do not take this into your own hands, you're really going to miss out on something. You're really going to miss out on something. Now that can be positive or negative in ordinary life. If you, if you do something you believe to be right, but it's going to be very costly, are you going to survive? And now folks, this is the real context of life in which we come to know the kingdom of God. It's what happens to us when we do what we know is right. Sometimes people ask me, well, how shall I know God? And I just tell them, take the Ten Commandments. If you don't like the first four, park those for a while. Just do the last six. And you'll come to know God. Because if God doesn't show up, you'll be dead. <laughs> then you get to know him that way. <laughs> But very likely he will show up and you will see his action in your life to keep you and help you when you simply do what he said. Let me give you a verse that is worth more than any college education. This is Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, that you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Why? The law of God aligns you with the kingdom of God. You are acting with him. Now, you must avoid the Pharisee's mistake, which is try to do what he said. No, no. You try to become the kind of person who would routinely and easily do what he said. That's how you keep the law. Not by trying to keep the law. That's why if you go into spiritual disciplines, you don't want to aim at behavior modification. And there are all sorts of interesting ways of talking about this. Some get me into things that are a little too long to deal with here, but just to say this, it's when the 12-step program for alcohol addiction goes beyond not drinking that it takes on power. <coughs> and of course, the steps of the 12 steps aim solidly at that. And actually, the first step just gives up says, we can't do it. And then you turn to something deeper and you turn to uh, various kinds of practices that we'll talk maybe a little bit about in the, in the last hour today. And they begin to take hold and you become a kind of person who doesn't come close to drinking because you've learned how to stay away from it but now you're a different kind of person. Because you see, you found out that if you don't drink, 
you'll be fine. In fact, you'll be better. So you're not missing out on anything by not drinking, except a lot of trouble. Right? So now you see you've, you've worked into a different position. Now that is what Jesus is talking about when he says, if you continue or abide. The word there is minnow, the verb minnow. It means to remain in, to continue in. And it's used very often. For example, in John 15, it is used to refer to how the branch relates to the vine. It abides. Jesus says later on, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you will ask what you will, and it will be done for you. Well, there's, one, there's one to spend some time on also. But the important thing is to understand this matter of abiding, of dwelling in. So when, we, when we're talking about this teaching of Jesus, uh, if you abide in my word, we're talking about putting into practice what he says. And of course that begins with the gospel. The gospel is the kingdom of God is at hand. Now what is the kingdom of God? We need to understand that and we need to stay out of all of the um, problems that have come up with reference to that uh, phrase. And uh, so let's just say very simply I'm on page three of the notes, if you have lost me. <laughs> Sorry about that, but that's one of the reasons why I like to hand you the notes, is, uh, is uh, you have them. <laughs> and uh, I try to s say specifically that knowledge of the kingdom of God comes through uh, putting his words into practice. And the main word that he has is the availability of the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is simply God acting. It's simply God acting. What is God doing? Uh, theologically, we talk about the reign of God. The reign of God. But that doesn't mean a lot to most people. And if you're trying to help your children understand what the kingdom of God is, I wouldn't start there. Okay. So what is God doing? Uh, and I would illustrate it with what is mama doing? Well, mama is making uh, something for dinner. Uh, and little children always want to be a part of what older people are doing. They love to be a part. That's how they take on their kingdom is by being immersed in the kingdoms and queendoms of the people that they live with. And that's why they just long to be involved with what their parents or their older siblings are doing. They don't actually have much of a kingdom when they're real small. They have a, a little bit, and of course, that begins with their body. That's what they first have to master uh, to begin to have a kingdom or a queendom, uh, and they learn that by being involved in what older people are doing, and uh, eventually they do things like even get credit cards, and then boy does their kingdom go. <laughs> that, you see. Because you see, every human being has a kingdom. Everyone. And your kingdom is what is under the range of your effective will. That's your kingdom, queendom, personedom, if you're bothered about things like that. So uh, you have your pockets and your pocketbooks right now. And no one else's hand belongs in your pocket, right? Or your pocketbook. Now, of course, someone can steal your identity. What are they doing when they do that? They are invading your kingdom. They are usurping the range of your effective will. Okay, now, please try to hold on to that because kingdom can just go vaporing. 
And you can try other words, but they don't really work very well. I mean, if you try government, it's even worse now. <laughs> but it's actually government. You have government. That's a part of you. You are made for that. God made you to have governance. And that's why enslaving someone uh, is one of the worst things you can do to another person. But in our personal relations, there are so many ways that we take away from the range of a person's effective will. And so that's a huge and important concept for you to have. God's kingdom is the range of his effective will. It's where God wants done. What he wants done is done. Now, obviously, that's very big. But he has made provision for some beings to not be in the range of his effective will. And most importantly for us, that's human beings have that. And there are many ways in which that happens. It can happen through ignorance. Uh, it can happen through rebellion. But uh, he gives to human beings the capacity to reject his kingdom or to accept it. Now, when Jesus came into the world and began his teaching, he was up against human arrangements that locked most people out of the kingdom of God. That's why he became so angry and says what he does in Matthew 23 and a few other places. Where he says, you, won't, you speaking to the Pharisees, you won't go in and you won't let others go in. You compass land and sea to make one proselyte, and when you've got him, you're making twofold more the child of hell than you yourselves are. Hmm. Because people were trying to control God and control who had access to him. The, uh, human beings like to play monopoly with religion. They like to say, if you don't come through our way, you don't come at all. It's an old story, isn't it? And you see the breakdown in the Protestant Reformation of an older story, and then you see very soon the same story emerging. If you don't agree with my doctrine and practice, which I alone can bring to you, <laughs> you're out. Right? And all the while, God is there. His kingdom is there. Anyone who cries out, you know, this may not set well with you, but I hope it does. It's easy to be saved. All you have to do is cry out to God. But there are other issues. Like, would you like God if you found him? I have a feeling there are a lot of people who are saved that have a, still a problem with God. <coughs> and God all the while is simply there in outpouring love. See, the amazing thing is not that God loves me. What would be amazing is if he didn't love me. Because he is love. He not love me. Because he is love. Wonderful that he loves me. The wonder is he is love. That's God. And he's trying to get as many people as love. That's God. <laughs> but if you don't really like God, you probably wouldn't like heaven. Because after all, he's going to be the biggest thing on the horizon there. <laughs> you know. But Jesus comes and opens the door and says, Now, you just begin to put my words into practice. The kingdom of heaven is available. Now, of course, you have to trust him unless you've got some other reason to think that and to understand what it means. So you trust him and you begin to step into the interactive presence of God. Now, I have to move fast here because that leads us to a discussion of grace. And grace is God acting in our lives to accomplish what we cannot accomplish on our own. That's grace. 
Grace is not just for forgiveness. It's for life. Grace is how the action of God comes to us. And so you have all these wonderful passages in the scripture. Well, one of the very richest is Hebrews 4, 14, I think it is. Let us therefore draw near to the throne of grace. The throne of grace is where grace is just pouring out. <coughs> just pouring out. That we might find grace to help in the time of need. That's the abundance of God's love comes where we are and we are able to act with him beside us. That's what stabilizes our whole life. Even David back in Psalm 16, 9 says, I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand. Now you can figure out how he could be both before me and at my right hand, but I don't think he would have a problem with that. I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand. Therefore, I shall not be moved. See, that's the secret of steady life in the knowledge of God. Is claiming the presence of God to act with you in all that you do. Of course, far beyond what you can just think up on your own. It surrounds you like an atmosphere. It moves, it goes far beyond anything that you could imagine. And actually, for the most part, you don't see it very well ahead of you. That's the domain of faith, but you see it back of you. The rearview mirror is the primary place that you see grace. You usually can't see it. Sometimes you can when you're acting. Sometimes you can't. But that's an arrangement that allows you to keep counting on God's action and presence with you, wherever you are, no matter what the circumstances. You simply follow the advice of the old proverb, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. You see, you might even think you could figure out grace to the point that you could trust your understanding of it. You can't. You're dealing with a person. It's important to understand that, and that'll keep you out of so much that is called spirituality, where spirituality is just treated like some sort of non-physical force that you can learn to work. That's idolatry. The form of idolatry is always using God to get what you want. And he will never put you in the position where you can do that. That's about the worst thing that could happen to you, if you could. And so grace is there. Grace is working far beyond your thoughts. And you learn to recognize that. If you're in business, if you're in education, arts, media, uh, Whatever you're doing, maybe there's no usual name for what you spend your time doing. God is there. And you learn to invite him in. Now, when you do that, then what Jesus says becomes true. If you abide in his word, that brings you into interactive relationship with the kingdom of God. And you will know that. You will have knowledge of it. And the knowledge of that will set you free. I'm afraid we have to quit for this hour. So, that's it. <laughs> I'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. From there. You know. From there.